Today is May 16, 2023. This is an Archives of Iowa Broadcasting Oral History interview. My name is Paul Yeager. I'll be the interviewer today. Our producer is Cliff Brockman, and our guest is Al Luke from KLGA Radio in Algona, Iowa. Al, good to have you here. Did you ever yeah. think you'd be the part of an oral history? No, not at all. I, I've been at this is 52 years for me. Matter of fact, first of April was 52 years in broadcasting for me. And when I started, no, I didn't think that I would be ever oral history interview material. Well, we'll get about how you started uh, and, and kind of how your career has gone. But where are you from, Al? Actually from, uh, and of course, the stations in Algona. I grew up uh, in uh, Whittemore, which is a town about 10 miles to the west of Algona. Uh, and also uh, kind of claim allegiance to the Fenton Central area as well. I graduated from Central High School, which was located at Fenton at that time. And so I sort of have my, I guess, between the two communities are home for me. Central with an S. Let's uh, remember that. Yes, Central with an S. You bet. So the home area, were you a farm kid or a city kid? Yep, grew up on a farm. The farm was actually located midway uh, between Whittemore and Fenton. And that's how I sort of wound up being with two towns, so to speak, allegiant with two towns, uh, Whittemore and Fenton, and I grew up on a farm all my life. Uh, went to college, and uh, from there, I guess it, instead of agriculture and farming, it's been radio. Although agriculture is still very important because I'm actually, a, have been the farm director here most of my career also. So it still ties in with my background. So when there was a young Al Luke, when he's on the farm, did you have visions of agriculture or was it visions of radio? It was always visions of radio. Uh, the How I got the start in radio, and this goes way back to when I was four years old, uh, my mother was a big fan of the 50s music scene, including Elvis. And she would, we had a big old console radio back then. You didn't, you have these beautiful console radios, wood console radios, and she would listen to Elvis on there and that kind of thing. And I became more charmed with, rather than the music, I was interested in the guys that were talking on the radio. And I, I would just sit there just enamored by the, uh, the guy on the radio. And I would say, well, I want to be that guy someday. I want, I want to be that guy that's introing Elvis and we're talking about Elvis. And so it, that, that love was always there. I told my kindergarten teacher that uh, I wanted to be in radio someday. This is Vaughn, my wonderful kindergarten teacher who went through many, many classes in the Whittemore School at that time, Whittemore Public School, and uh, told her I was going to be a, a, and she said, oh, you mean you're going to be a disc jockey? And of course, that was a new term to me, but, <laughs> but that's what it was. So that, and, and then uh, as I got older, that desire to do this never changed. High school, I was very active in speech, took a lot of speech classes, state speech, uh, went into the, the radio speaking part of state speech, actually won a, a top division in state uh, speech for radio. So yeah, that and from there it was into college, and I guess the rest is kind of here we are 52 years later. So as a kindergartner, is that what I heard you say? That's when you knew? That's when I knew, yes. Yeah. Um, as a kindergartner, did you have as good of a voice then? As you do now? Yeah, I really do. I think I, I've always had a strong voice. I think because I always had, see, I love to talk, okay? I, I would get in trouble because I always wanted to do show and tell. And they would say, no, it isn't, you know, not your turn for show and tell. I, I loved, to, so I all, even then, back then, I loved to talk. I would hog the front part of the classroom when it was time for show and tell. And they had to tell me, you know, sit down. You, you, you've had your turn or, you know, I mean, not today. <laughs> So I've always had that. Well, were you like the announcement reader? You know, today in lunch, it will be a corn yes. salad. Yeah, with... that's okay. true. Yeah, that I did you. that. Uh, get it, used to practice for this. when we, It was getting close to speech contest time when I was in high school, freshman, sophomore, all, all through high school. And they would uh, let, sometimes as a practice, would let me take over the PA and would actually read like a mock newscast or a weather forecast or something just because they knew that I was... Uh, interested in radio so they let me do this so i could you know it was good practice for me this is strange i used to i got to tell you this okay uh, uh bob jennings is a good friend of mine i think most of you know he was a great broadcaster worked with him for many years here at klga good friend of mine he found out through a mutual classmate 
that I used to go into the bathroom at lunchtime and would broadcast from the bathroom stall like I was on radio. And I used to get an audience of kids in the bathroom while I did my broad, I did my spiel, my radio stick, so to speak, uh, over the lunch hour till a teacher came in one day and said, what in the world are you doing? <laughs> and, and, and when we told him, he thought, I think he did, he, he just shook his head and walked away. So <laughs> were you hidden behind a stall doing this? Yes, so it was yes, truly your yes. voice. It wasn't you was presenting with the face. Right. It was, uh, I was not doing it, it. It was, I was inside the stall of the men's bathroom talking and an audience would gather out by the bathroom door around it. And uh, this was a pretty regular routine. I have to admit, Al, I don't think I've ever heard any one of these folks say that they were broadcasting from the bathroom on the second <laughs> floor at Whittemore, Whittemore Elementary here. Al, Luck with you. Al Luke with you. Uh, Al, were there voices that you heard and said, I want to sound like that when you were younger? Yes. Um, I, my favorite station at that time was WHB in Kansas City, Missouri. Of course, keep in mind, this is the 1950s and you have some of these powerhouse stations that uh, come in and they had some pretty darn good announcers uh, that were really professional. And so I, even as you know, five, four, five years old, six years old, I was absolutely in love with WHB and their announcers. They, they, you know, they were funny and very upbeat and you know, the world's happiest broadcasters is what that stood for at that time. And so it was a very upbeat format, and uh, I used to really love listening to that one. As I got into uh, more into junior high, high school years, we had a lot of these 50,000 powerhouses that came in at night. WLS in Chicago was one. Uh, there was a, one in KEYL in, the, I think it was Little Rock, Arkansas, uh, was, was a, another station that was quite popular. And so, yeah, WLS, uh, Larry Lou Jack was popular on there when I was in my high school years. Used to really listen to him and try and maybe mock that style a little bit. So you had inspirations. And did yes. you have someone locally that was giving you feedback saying, Al, I think you should try this or you should try that? Well, I had a chance of meeting him when I was in high school at a career fair one time, like my junior year. His name was George Allen. And uh, I used to listen to him on KLGA and uh, was really loved his voice. George had a powerful, bassy voice that was kind of really common in radio at that time, was needed to be in radio at that time. And uh, I used to listen to him uh, at, when I was at home. He would do newscasts and things like that and, on KLGA. And he also was an inspiration. And I, I, I met him at a career fair when I was in high school and uh, uh from there, I went to college, and he was on the board of directors at Iowa Central Community College. That's where I graduated from in their radio program. And that's how I got to know him better through that. I had met him, like I said, when I was in high school. But uh, he came up one day after uh, he had lectured the class in college and said, I've got a part-time opening coming up, and I know you're from the Algona area. You probably get home on weekends. Uh, why don't you stop and talk to me, and we'll see what we can work out. So I did. That was my freshman year. I uh, wound up doing internship that summer here at KLGA. And uh, about the time I was ready to graduate, their morning announcer left for a 50,000-watt station out in Nebraska. And so that uh, kind of opened up possibilities. And he said, well, would you, uh, I, I can hold this job for you if you want it when you graduate. And so I did. And, and like I say, again, here we are 50 plus years later. So those are, these are the only call letters you've worked for the uh, we did have a college radio station uh, we were the first in iowa central we were the 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 first class to go into that broadcasting program we pioneered that program and so there was no state when i started as a freshman there was no station on the air no college station but it was our class uh, about middle part of our freshman year that we put on a radio station called kicb standing for iowa central broadcasters i believe that station still exists today in port dodge uh, we wound up making it uh, this, this next year. We put on a low power FM uh, with the same call letters. And uh, we were on the FM. And at that point, we were on AM was a current carrier to the dorms. FM covered pretty much the whole city of Fort Dodge. I think we had a, maybe a whole 50, 10, 15 watts, but it yes. still covered Fort Dodge. Yes, 10 watts of power is a big deal. Yes, it, for, for college kids, we, we were on top of the world. We, were on, we really were. We were on top of the world. So this is 1972 then when you start full-time at KLGA? 
Yes, correct. Uh, 1971 uh, was my internship. That was your internship I, year. Yep, okay. yep. And I did already work. Uh, I worked a lot of my, my internship. I worked a lot. Uh, I think maybe luckily George liked the work I was doing, whatever it was. But it was uh, like interns sometimes now only get a few hours or that type of thing. He pretty much was had me working full time as an intern and it was actually paying me for the internship, too. So. But maybe a little less than what another announcer may make. But that's, uh, that's true. Yeah, that's yeah. another story for another day. Uh, when yep. you start at the station, what's the staffing like? Well, at that time, OK, <laughs> KLGA was a rural station. And by I mean a rural station, it was out in the country on a gravel road. It was uh, west of Algona. McGregor Road is a blacktop. And then it was about a quarter of a mile or so off of McGregor yet on a gravel road. And it was at the site where the tower grounds were, which was common for stations back then uh, because it didn't have the technology that you could remote like we have today. Keep in mind, KLGA went on the air in 1956. So it was an AM daytimer at that time and went on the air in 1956. So it was very much a rural station uh, out in the country. As far as staffing, uh, we had, I think, uh, maybe five people on the staff, in, and that included a, a, a sales manager, a person that was announcer, combination engineer, a morning man, and then and that kind of an afternoon, evening person. And that's pretty much what we had for staff. We did have one woman on the staff, uh, and uh, she was mostly office person, but did work a little bit on the air as well. So, and that was our staffing. And at what? How long did you stay at that rural location? Uh, many, many years. We went through two editions there. We had a 1974 edition, which enlarged the front office area and production room areas. Uh, then in uh, 1979, we added on a announcer's office area and expanded the newsroom. In 1979, we stayed there. We have moved out of that. I think it's been maybe six years ago that we moved into the new facility where I'm speaking to you from today. Oh, so you were in that old building for 40 plus years. Yes, cool. yes, yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so that building, that staff, you, you mentioned the newsroom. What was the focus of the station when you know you're all, you, you weren't the 50,000 watt station, but you were the community station? What was the focus of the station? We were uh, totally community oriented. Uh, we had uh, everything. It was it was lost. In, and really, you know, the focus is not all that much different today. It was the lost and found department, uh, lost dogs and cats and anything going on in the community. Uh, back then, we did something back then that we don't dare do today. Uh, we used to even broadcast like the fire calls. You know, the scanner would go yeah. off for the we'd have a police and we would say, and the fire today is that so and so, you know, and uh, please don't follow the fire trucks and that kind of thing. But yeah, so if people used to tune in to the radio to find out, you know, gosh, where's the fire at, you know, that kind of thing, you know, something we couldn't do today uh, because it would just would not be considered a correct thing to do. But back then we did it. It was different times and it was probably part of our community focus. Uh, we weather information. We were big on weather information. Used to if uh, worked with a news director by the name of Randy Renshaw. 1974, he became our news director. Went to college with him at Iowa Central. Uh, he started a couple years uh, full time. He worked in Storm Lake for a while at KYL, and then uh, moved over to Algona as our news director. He was big on on weather. If there was a tornado reported, he would go chase it. And then we had a remote broadcast, a little transmitter, uh, a Marty transmitter that he put in his car, ran off batteries, and he would broadcast the tornado. Uh, in fact, he won a award for doing the play-by-play -play of a tornado funnel cloud over north of Whittemore back sometime in the 70s. And we did a lot of it. But, you know, you would say, well, he was a weather chaser, a tornado chaser, that kind of, yeah, but yet it was very much part of our local news coverage and, and the local focus that we had. The weather was number one, a lot of information on farm news, courthouse beat, police beat, uh, just in, anything. It was as much local as we could possibly, as, as George Allen, my, my first boss and owner at that time would say, I'd read from the phone book if I could tie it into local programming, good local programming somehow, because, it, you know, the local names, everything local. Al, I'm pretty sure people would actually pay to listen to you read the phone book, um, you know, like to just make sure they hear your voice again and again. We still, do, we still do things like we have the birthday calendar that we do, again, getting those local names on. It's all local focus. Community calendar is still part of our my morning uh, routine that we do. 
Uh, of course, the weather information, we still have uh, local news uh, with the news director. So, it, it, you know, the, the focus hasn't really changed all that much. And is the staffing about the same size? It sounds we maybe a it's little, a little smaller. Uh, we actually have a little bigger staff right now. We have seven people on staff here. Uh, and at one time, we probably did have in, in its what I call its heyday of uh, radio, which to me was the 1970s was awesome time for radio, 70s, early 80s. And we had we had two we had a two staff, two full time uh, news people at that time, uh, along with myself, who covered the farm news at that time. So so we had a staff at that time and we had two front reception people, two office people. We were up to, I believe, to a staff of about nine or 10 there in the late 70s, early 80s until the farm crisis hit. And I remember the 1980 farm crisis, about 1984, 85. That's when we had to do some cutbacks, as did virtually every other business in the state of Iowa. So farm crisis would have been a major story, a uh, community event in, in all of farm country. Yes, absolutely. Uh, I used to, uh, uh, one item I remember covering as the farm director, and it was a very sad event, almost brought tears to my eyes, uh, we they had to they auctioned off a farm on the courthouse steps. And again, this would have been sometime in the mid '80s. It was a tax sale auction kind of thing, and uh, the guy that owned the farm was there, of course, and was in tears. And it it was just a tear jerking event. So that's one event I remember so well covering from that era of the farm crisis. You spent time. Has the whole career been as a farm director or? Part of your oh, title, I, or I have done virtually everything <laughs> at one time or another. Uh, we had uh, a news director. Uh, the second news director I worked with was a girl named Jody. She was raising a family at that time and uh, was having children, was growing her family at that time. So she would go on maternity leave. So then I would get bumped up to from farm director. I would be a substitute news director during those maternity leaves, and that happened, I think, two or three times in the 10 year time period. So uh, I, I've done that. Uh, I also do sales and I'm still very active in sales. Uh, did that. Uh, of course, we know how great radio does pay and uh, the sales helped. You know, it kind of supplemented the income a little bit. So it was part time sales, which I still am. And uh, did that um, morning board shift, which I still do today. That was uh, all part of the, the duties. Got involved a bit with engineering too. Our engineer was a great guy and uh, welcomed a little help from time to time. And I, I had some mechanical abilities or some interest in engineering. So I would uh, help in that, in that department also. And uh, right now I'm still the chief, I'm the chief on the FCC license. I am the chief designated operator, meaning I do the record keeping and and, and and kind of oversee the make make sure everything's working. That's what a chief designated operator does. You're still full time. I'm still full time. So part sales, part operations, part board op, part what else am I missing? Did, did farm I, did director? I, yeah, farm, farm director, yeah. Uh, garbage collector. Yep, do that too. Yes, yeah. <laughs> I really do. What Friday is night. it? <laughs> what is it about your community embracing your station that keeps? you going i think it's because we are part of the uh, community very much a part of the community over the years uh, i i think our radio station in particular uh, has been blessed by having owners and managers including the present owner bernie merrill is our present owner operator uh, and and all you know, all of them had one basic philosophy and that was uh, community oriented and they appreciated live radio rather than voice tracking or, you know, turn on the satellite and let it go, that kind of thing, which kind of became the philosophy there for so many years, uh, late 80s, 90s, uh, consolidation, those kind of things. Uh, I think that's why we are, even today, are so much a part of the community because we've always been there. It's been live, local, radio, real announcers, real people that are part of the community from the station manager on down to uh, the, the announcers like, like myself. Uh, tend to be local people, and or at least they become local people. They we're, we're heavily involved in sports, uh, the schools, the kids. That, that's that's what makes great local radio and makes you become a part of people's lives. When you say it's a part of everyone's life and the schools, how many stations do you think do 
the level of local commitment that you do around the state today in 2023? I would say it's less than what it was uh, when I originally started in the business, because then we had so many radios. To, it, virtually, there was a time period where pretty much every town that was about a 4,000 population or so had some type of radio station. It may have been a low power one, but some type of radio station. Uh, and then things kind of consolidated. The satellite radio came along. And I think there's less and less of that. Uh, just to show you the type of commitment we have, uh, Sunday afternoon, uh, we have two high schools in town. We have Bishop Garrigan uh, High School, which is a, a private uh, a Catholic school, very good school, and uh, Algona Public School, wonderful school. Uh, we actually broadcast the high school graduations. Last uh, Sunday afternoon, um, I hosted the Garrigan graduation on the radio, set up at the graduation, broadcast the ceremony in its entirety. And then this Sunday is coming Sunday will be the Algona graduation. And uh, Bernie is going to personally host that one. So, and this is something we've done for years and years. So this is the type of involvement we have in the schools uh, and local sports from the schools broadcast live from schools all around Northern Iowa uh, is uh, something else that we do. In my day, Al, uh, listening to the radio, I would go find my recorder and hold it up to the radio, the cassette recorder, to record programming. Do you know of people that have done that to you or your events where they have recorded or they've asked for air checks of, you covered my graduation in 1992. Do you still have that tape? Okay. Um, we are, our, our, our archives are maybe not as good as they could be. Uh, some of the recent years we do have because we started recording a lot of this stuff and it's you know online. We have an algonoradio.com and we have a lot of games and things like that that are archived. And so people can go back and catch them that way. Um, but a lot of the early ones are gone. But we used to do that. We used to have people, especially when in the 90s when we could burn CDs, we would have people say, oh, could you get a copy of that and we would have yeah. the game record it so we would burn them a cd and charge them like five bucks or something for it you know that kind of thing that was, was your time i mean you had to spend time to do it but it was also a good service yes yes and so we used to get a lot of requests for that for that kind of thing you mentioned uh the internet how has the internet not taken away local from you well for in a sense it does i, I I think we have to be focused as broadcasters if you're going to survive in these small communities, uh, and by small communities, I mean 6,000 or mm -hmm. maybe even 20,000, 25,000. Uh, you have to really be focused on your local market as much as possible and, and constantly be thinking of things that maybe you can do uh, to become a part of the community. I mean, you constantly have to be innovating, creating ideas of community events you can get involved in just things you can do to promote your station, get that presence there. Uh, and of course, we have our own site, algonoradio.com, which uh, has thousands of hits every every week and is in itself. Uh, we, we have every, pretty much everything that's on the radio is on algonoradio.com in one way or another. Career starter, uh, job listings from the area, local news stories, uh, community calendar events. It's it's all there. And I think you say, well, you're in competition with yourself. I think the two complement each other very well. Mm -hmm. School menus still do lunch menus. Uh, though, that's one thing we stopped doing. Uh, we for some reason we did when for many years uh, <laughs> we used to stop about 640 in the morning. We close out that first 630 local newscast and we used to when uh, read the local local lunch menus from schools around the area. And for some reason, we got away from that. It's, I think uh, it was one of those things where we just decided, well, maybe it's time to you know, get away from that and replace it with something else, which we did. At that time, I started doing a Kasuth County Extension report, interviewed the local people at the Extension office in that time slot instead. And we still do that. So, You mentioned the lost and found. Is that your version of Radio Tradio, or do you also do that pro type of program too? Um, the closest thing we come to uh, a radio trade type program, we do have Radio Restaurant. And what's and that? Radio Restaurant is a program where uh, we sell radio, we sell certificates to local restaurants at a discount price. The listeners call in, 
In other words, uh, uh, it's, it's a two-person show, usually in the afternoon. We do this seasonally. There's usually a spring session and a fall winter session. Uh, and we get on the radio and uh, we'll say, all right, we've got, we've got six restaurants here today. You know, we, we, we've got one in Fenton, a couple in Laverne. We've got four restaurants in Algona today. And then we'll name the restaurants and talk a little bit about them. And, you know, start calling now. Uh, you get $10 certificate for $7.50. So, and they call in, make the purchase, and then they come to the studio and pick up their certificates, or we'll mail it to them if they're way out of town. And so that's 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 about the closest thing to uh, an auction trade radio type of thing that we do. But it's fun. We have a great time with it. It sounds like uh, sales may have something to have done with that. Or... Yes, because uh, we we sell these to the restaurants. Uh, yeah, uh, that's it is a trade out for them, the restaurant, and, and and then of course we get to keep what whatever sales that generates, we get to keep that money, and it's it's been a good deal for it. It's been and it's real popular with our listeners. Our listeners love it. The phone goes nuts. Speaking of restaurants, how often do they deliver to you to have you talk about their uh, food on air? The restaurants don't so much do that, but what we do get. Uh, is, you know, and again, this is that community involvement. It really is. Saturday morning, Fireman's Pancake Breakfast, for example, Kiwana's Pancake, you know, virtually there ain't hardly a service club out there that don't have some type of omelet breakfast, pancake breakfast, that kind of thing. And they usually will deliver those like on a Saturday morning. I, I still work certain Saturdays. We rotate Saturdays. And if you're lucky enough to be working on a Saturday when it's a pancake day or an omelet day or something like that, why it's it's usually... It's just be like, oh gosh, I'm looking forward to working this Saturday. I get pancakes, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> you know, radio broadcasters, we love we love to eat. So I love that. I'm hungry now. I shouldn't have mentioned the food side <laughs> of things. Uh, when uh, when you do these live remotes at at, at places, uh, I'm guessing it always used to be that you had to have a phone line. How are you yes. doing these live remotes now, technology wise? Yes, that has changed a lot. Uh, what we, we use the Marty system here, which was you would set up a little antenna, about a oh, about a six foot antenna that you would take into the store and you would take in this little box, which was back in my early days was a big box as opposed to a smaller box that came about in like in the 90s, a big heavy old box. And you would carry it in, set all this stuff up and, and broadcast from there. Uh, then we went to, it was in the 90s, we went to a smaller Marty. It, it was the same power, but it just took up less space. Didn't have tubes in it anymore. It had transistors and things like that. In. Well, that gave out uh, maybe about 10 years ago now. And so then we went to uh, technology and we now actually use a internet based system where we use a, a hotspot and we still use a mixer and a hotspot and that links right into the control board via internet. So yeah, technology has changed that so much. And, and so, yeah, the phone line used to be the lifeline, then the Marty, then the internet. I get it. Uh, so then when you're doing high school games, is it again off the internet hotspot or is that yes, how that it, would be? It either goes off the hotspot or if the school has a con convenient access to actual ethernet that we can hook uh -huh. into we will do that. We prefer that anymore because it is so much more reliable. Thing is, what we find uh, with these hotspot games is, okay, you go to a game uh, and there's a lot of people at the game and you're using the hotspot data and everybody gets on their cell phone, cell phones, starts sending, you know, they're, they're sending that game home. So grandma can see the, the, you know, her grandchild play in the game and all of a sudden the, the data space just dwindles down and pretty soon we've got breakups on the radio audio. So if we can do a ethernet hookup good and solid, we, we prefer that and do that whenever we can. But we do use the hotspot. Sometimes you have to, there's no choice. Do you feel like you're still working? Does this ever been work for you? No, for me, it has not. Uh, I'm one of those guys where they would say, you know, well, he never worked a day in his life because you're doing something that you love. Uh, that's That truly is me. Which, which is a blessing because I had a, a friend of mine who was a psychologist and he used to always say, you know, work should be play. And, and, and I, and he used to say, and I know he used to say, Al, I know with you it is. So, and, and he was right. You mentioned a tornado that uh, one of your news folks uh, had won an award for. You had a big tornado in 1979. You talk about the farm crisis. What are some events that stand out to you that you were a part of in coverage? Well, the the 1979 tornado, that was June of 1979, 
uh, is certainly a day that one will never forget because uh, for Algona, it was supposed to be a celebration that week because it was our Quas Qui Centennial. Mm -hmm. And, and there was all these celebrations planned. Matter of fact, there was supposed to be a big air show the next day out at the airport. And I was supposed to be the master of ceremonies at that show. So I'd been out to the airport that afternoon, actually had gone up in a biplane that afternoon because it was such a beautiful day and uh, got done with that, uh, was at home. And of course, all of a sudden, every, the skies got black as could be. I live, actually lived in Whittemore at that time, north of Whittemore. And skies got black over Algona, you could see it, and it wasn't too long. They actually, the tornado hit about seven, a little after seven in the evening, seven ten, right in there. And uh, communications were knocked out. But luckily, the radio station survived because we were west of town in those old studios at that time. The towers were there, so we didn't get knocked out. So the radio kept going. And that's how they called me into work. I was listening on the radio at home, and the announcer on duty said, we need everybody here. Al, if you're listening, we need you now. So I jumped in the car, headed to work, and that's when we went into emergency mode. I guess, as radio can do. Mm -hmm. uh, and we had a pretty experienced radio team at that time. Uh, some of the guys that had been in radio for 30 years that were with us. Randy Renshaw was our news director, who was uh, awesome news director, community-minded. So everybody fit right. We knew what to do. So we instantly went to work. Uh, and of course, communications were out. Uh, the, it, it, was, it was just a mess. Good part of the town destroyed. Uh, so we set up a uh, transmitter, our Marty transmitters. We had three Marty transmitters. So we set all three up, one at the hospital, one at the law enforcement center, one in a car, the portable one in the car. So we could go out and uh, do coverage of where things were damaged and that kind of thing. And we did this, uh, of course, AM, keep in mind, it's 1979. So AM radio was king. We were 1600 on the dial, 5,000 watts. We did have the FM already. It was quite new. The AM was king. So it was a daytime AM. So we decided, well, we can't sign off. You know, we, we, we just have to stay on. So our owner, George Allen, notified the uh, FCC that we were going to be going 24 hours full power because of an emergency. Uh, FCC responded very quickly, said, yes, do it. And so we broadcast uh, pretty much nonstop for about three days, 24 hours. And no computer. Remember, there's no computers that you could say, well, oh, man, we're beat. We're just going to go computer for a couple hours. Uh, we, we all, the announcers all took turns for that three-day time period, keeping the station on the air. We broadcast emergency messages because people didn't know where people were. There were people missing. And so if somebody was found, we would say, don't worry. So somebody, you know, this person is at so-and-so's house. He or she is safe. Don't need to worry anymore. You know, it was that kind of thing. And we broadcast things like that for about three days, uh, talked to city officials, uh, state officials, trying to get help into the community. If there was help on the way, we could announce that. You know, it was just nonstop local coverage and for three days you mentioned um how long is your morning show now that you're a part of uh i'm six to ten so you're on for four hours each day uh what's the longest shift other than that tornado that you may have worked uh in a continuous fashion where you were helping at a big event whether it's rag riding into town or or something else i think the longest shift i had on a regular basis by the way and so our AM, as this is my early careers, okay, you got to start somewhere on a shift somewhere. Uh, we had a Sunday shift. And since it was a daytime station, we on Sundays, we would basically run from 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. And so they would staff it with one guy. And for a while in his early careers, that guy was me. So uh -huh. a lot of Sundays <laughs> yeah. in the studio. Yeah. yeah, seven to five. Do you does your station have any automated programming? Yes, we do. We we have you know, in the evening hours. Okay. We are live on our KLGA ninety two seven. So we actually have two stations. There's a ninety eight five home country, and uh, the ninety two seven uses the the slogan of hometown radio. And we are live on hometown radio from six a.m. till seven p.m. There's actually a person in the building that's on the air live. Uh, to do announcements and, and and does do regular announcements in those time periods, DJing and so on. Uh, and then, of course, 
at seven o'clock, then the computer takes over unless we have a ball game. Sure. Uh, th then it's live, you know, from the game. And of course, lots of nights, uh, school year and even in the summer, baseball, softball, uh, there is live ball games. So really, in most days, we are pretty much live in one way or another from 6 a.m. till about 9 p.m., really. A and rare then, breed uh, yes. in, in broadcasting right now, especially in radio. Uh, those sporting events, did you ever do any sports? That's one thing I haven't done is is sports. I just never, I, I love listening to our local sports. Uh, uh, over the years, uh, we've had some awesome sports people on the station and some, some great local ball games and some great local teams. Uh, even this past year, we had uh, both uh, the Garrigan girls were at state basketball tournament, uh, big winners, and uh, the Algona Bulldogs, uh, first time for quite a few years, made it to state tournament games. So uh, I, I love listening to it on the radio, but I've never done the play-by-play. -play. Well, I should say one time I have, not on KLGA, but on the station in Fort Dodge when I was in college, you had to do at least one ball game. So that was part of the, you know, if you're going to pass this course, you're going to do a ball, go and do a ball game. So we did a, a Fort Dodge game. What is, uh, are you still introducing records ever? Or is it just mostly community events? We'll be back after this, uh, you know, whatever the interview is. Do you still no, get we, to do any we still, intros? We still, yeah, we still do intros, outros uh, much. The we do a, I do a DJ show probably the same now as I did in the 1970s. Uh, just that we do not queue up the 45 RPM record anymore. Uh, <laughs> it's a song title on the computer. Yeah. But yes, we, uh, I mean, very much still do. And, and we, we do a lot of specialty programs during the day. Even uh, we have a program, our afternoon person, uh, Mike Bandy, three o'clock, does a program called Throwback at Three. That's every day. And we go back through the years. It could be anything. He usually picks a certain time period each day, like maybe one day it might be the 70s and maybe the next day it's songs from the 90s. But it's, you know, it, it is a oldies kind of throwback show so that's just one thing we do we have a cover challenge at 4 15 that we do and we'll take two ver the original version of a song and maybe a later cover version and the listeners get to vote on we have a set up on facebook the listeners can decide which version they like better through our klga facebook page how will radio survive another 50 years is it the way your station has done it or is it going to be more of what so much radio is now you have no idea who's on that station. I think if it is going to survive, uh, unless we do get more local focused, I think uh, uh, radio could, it, it's got to be, in order for radio to succeed in the future, it's got to be relevant. It's got to be relevant to the people in the community, relevant to their lives, what's going on in their lives. Otherwise, if it loses that connectivity, uh, with the people and community, uh, they they can listen to the latest song anywhere. I mean, they they can go on Sirius XM for unlimited music for not very much money a month. Uh, they can download stuff even for less than that on cell phones. So if if it's just if you if you're just going to do music and maybe some national programming, they can get that at so many places. Yeah. Uh, we have to make it. There has to be an owl or you know uh, that. We'll tell them locally what's going on and and a face that they know and a voice that they know day in and day out. It has to be a place where when you go into the diner, hey, I heard I heard Al talking about you on the radio this morning. What's that all about? Yep. And that's and, and that's what it's going to take. If radio is going to survive, it's going to take that. Uh, and of course, we have to compete with the latest technology or adapt the latest technology in order to you know, can't necessarily do it the same as you did to maybe today or as we did 20 years ago. But I, I think that basic philosophy is where radio's future is still going to be. My hometown is less than 3,000 people, does not have a radio station. It did have a newspaper for a number of years. The newspaper has gone away. It's now a podcast. Two guys talk about the, a little bit of news from the community, and that's it. At what point do podcasts take your place if they can do local in a much shorter form maybe not live but at least have some update do you ever see that local podcast as a competition for you 
Probably, perhaps, uh, it could be. Uh, the thing about the advantage maybe that radio could have is we can, you know, a podcast is typically a very select topic, a very select thing. Uh, with radio, we can be a little more broader. I mean, we can cover the things they cover in the podcast, but when you have a, a staff of people, you can do so much more. We, we can do sports. Uh, we can do the farm news. Uh, we can still play some music, you know, that people like uh, and everything. And, and the world and national, you know, radio, I think of radio has to be a complete package. Yes, you've got to have to survive. You need the local. Local has to be priority one. But uh, if you're going to compete with some of these new things coming along, I still think you have to have uh, a certain variety. You, you, you got to cover it all, everything. Maybe your world and national news is only a, a two minute newscast and your local is a five or 10 minute newscast. But I think you need to have all of these elements together to make it a complete package. So it, that way you're going to be relevant to more people. When you go in and out of businesses in Algona, uh, and they're not list they don't have your station on the radio. Do you ask them to change it? Usually, no, I don't say anything. I, I just because they already have it on. Yeah, it in <laughs> most cases, actually, a lot of uh, stores in our community do have yeah. us on. Matter of fact, right now, uh, outside of our studio, uh, we have a rain gauge outside the studio. That's part of the weather thing. We give the local rainfall every morning, the rainfall from downtown Algona. And uh the there's a car wash that's across the street from the studios and uh, they have a pa system that is carrying our station and you can hear it over you know i can when i go out to measure the rain i don't have to worry about that the state you know is is my computer going to stop or something because i can hear it playing from the car wash that's over there so yes. to me that and we and that's typical it's just awesome that we're on in so many stores and places in the community in 2021, you had a special evening um, as the Iowa Broadcaster of the Year. What yes. did that award mean to you? That uh, really that that was given to me in my my 50th year of broadcasting. It was a 50th anniversary. Uh, that whole year was just tremendous. Uh, the the owner of our station at that time she was manager was not owner yet at that time, but uh, became owner a couple years later. But uh, she decided that she was going to make it like my best year ever. And uh, the, the whole staff was on board with this, not just Bernie, but the whole staff. And they, they truly did make it my best year ever. And that uh, getting that award, I still have uh, that displayed on my desk very proudly. And I just consider that to be uh, maybe a, uh, just a, you know, a very much rewarding achievement. Uh, for spending 50 years in the business at that time. So, yes, it was very special. How many vacation days does Al Luke take? Well, uh, <laughs> my boss would tell me that I'd never use them all because uh, I actually get about, I could take up to a month's worth of vacation, uh, you know, the five day equivalent of five day week a, a month. But uh, actually, I tend to not take vacation days probably not now as much as what I used to, you know, it's one of those things, uh, I enjoy what I do. And after you've been in the business for 50 some years, you realize that I'm probably not going to be doing this for another 50. Okay. I mean, you know, so you tend to cherish those days and do what you love. And so I almost tend to work as opposed to, I, I take some days off. I won't say I don't take any, but uh, uh, I, I enjoy what I do and know that, you know, I'm, I'm 70, uh, I'll be 71 years old this summer. And uh, you realize that uh, uh, you sort of start cherishing every day and doing what you love, which for me is radio. And you just know that, uh, uh, something can happen. You know, I, I have friends that are doing fine and all of a sudden at age, you know, 70 some, maybe uh, some illness set in and they are forced to retire or forced to stop doing what they want to do. How's Al Luke going to be remembered then? How do you want to be remembered, Al? Well, you know, I was thinking about that <laughs> in the last, uh, I would say uh, I would want to be remembered as 
that friendly voice on the radio, that friendly, caring voice that was on the radio and that was on the radio day in and day out, a, a friend for life. And I think that's how I would want to be uh, remembered, that I was just always there and uh, caring, very, uh, you know, very much uh, a, a voice that was part of their homes and, like I say, a friend for life. And uh, we're glad to meet your acquaintance, and hopefully we can be friends. And uh, you, you you certainly uh, reminded me, Al, here of the importance that a broadcaster has to remember, yes, the term is broad, but you still are having a one-on-one -on -one conversation with people. Yep, absolutely. Very true. Because they, they don't, you're a guest in their home or their car or their business, uh, their office, you're, you're a guest and they, they don't have to invite you in. You know, they can, they can say, okay, that's enough, <laughs> leave <laughs> and turn it off. So you always have to remember that you're right. It is very much a one-on-one -on -one business. Al Luke, KLGA Radio, Algona, Iowa. Al, thank you so very much. Yes, very, very welcome, Paul. It was nice to, uh, meeting you uh, via Zoom. <laughs> very good. And this has been one of our Zoom interviews that we've done with the Archives of Iowa Broadcasting. This is an oral history. Our producer today is Cliff Brockman. My name is Paul Yeager. Thank you so much for watching or reading this transcript. And we'll see you again next time on our next oral history.